looks like a real good turnout for us tonight. And what we have tonight is uh, four of the candidates running for state office. There's first is Mike Green running for the 31st State Senate, Kevin Bailey running for the 31st State Senate, and Carl Yider running for the 98th State House, and Gary Glenn running for the 98th State House. Our candidate forum will be moderated by Jim Boren. And I just wanted to kind of go over the format we're going to use. First off, this is not a debate, despite some mention to the contrary. Please save any rebuttals for your closing statements before talking to the candidates. And the questions have been chosen at random from the list provided to each campaign. The candidate starting order will alternate with each new question. Candidates will be given 60 seconds to answer each question, with the exception of the first question, which you will have 90 seconds. After the series of questions, we will take some audience submitted questions with the same 60 seconds to answer. And on the audience questions, we have some ink pens and little scrap pieces of paper. While we're going through the first series, uh, if you want to have something, you want to be want to uh, ask the candidate, if you would. Uh, Write it down, there's some people around that you can hand that to. And they will pick a few of them out and get, get them to our moderator so he can ask those. At the end of the questioning, there will be a two minute closing statement for each candidate. And we ask that the audience please remain respectful during the whole forum. Uh, you know, many of us have our favorites, but let's try to treat everyone with very much respect. And if you can feel compelled to applaud, please wait until the little questioning is done. And this will just help us speed up the process. We've got a lot to try and get through tonight. So I guess with that, we'll get started. Mm -hmm. I need the yeah, if the candidates will <laughs> please come up. <laughs> We've come a long ways with our economy. We're not out yet. 
a long ways to accommodate. I think the policies that I've worked on as appropriations chair, balancing our budget, somewhat bringing more jobs back to our state is a start, but I still believe there's more to go. And uh, that's why I'm running again. Thank you. I'm Carl Yeider, I'm running for the state representative of the 98th House District. I appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight for the planning committee. The reason I'm running for office, there's several reasons. Um, one, I'm a father, a husband, and a small business owner like many of you out there. And I've never run for office before. But I'm running to make a difference, a difference in your lives. Um, in the front row, two of the reasons I'm running for office. My daughters, Abigail, 10 years old, who's here tonight, and Rachel, my three-year-old, who many of you have met before at other We the People meetings. It's never too early to start on the good conservative values. I have one more daughter, Rachel, who's not here, but she's off at camp. But as I look at my kids, I'm tired of career politicians putting politics before the, our children's future. So they're one of the many reasons that I'm running for office tonight. Now I'm going to concentrate on three areas, jobs, family, community. You'll hear that over and over again. But as your state representative, when a piece of legislation is in front of me, I'm going to ask myself, is it good for jobs? Is it good for families? Is it good for communities? And if the answer is yes, I will support it. It's just, okay, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> had to read the sign. 15 seconds up. It's just like the we the people, the three values you guys believe in. I believe 100% in because those are all good for jobs, family, and community. So I support that 100%. Again, thank you. Thank you. My name is Kevin Daly. I'm the current state representative in Lapeer County. I'm assuming most of you probably all know you're pretty well engaged up here, but uh, the 31st Senate District is changing this time around. It will now be Lapeer County, Tuscola County, and Bay County. So um, I ran for office uh, six years ago. Came a state house representative. I'm a uh, uh, lifelong farmer down in Lapeer County. Uh, farmed my entire life, full time dairy operation. Uh, decided about six years ago, my wife's uh, uh, interest, I guess, that I run for a state office. Uh, so I got involved. I was involved in local township government for 24 years. I enjoy working for the people. I believe we should work for the people. I'm a very accessible person. You can call my cell phone number. If you pick up one of my pieces of literature back there, it's the original cell phone number I had. When I got my cell phone first about 15 years ago. So I allow that uh, accessibility to myself because I think that's what we should do once we're elected. I think we should be accessible to the people. We should be at events and we should be available to answer your questions. I'm running because I, I still feel like there's more that we need to do. Believe it or not, when I first got in the legislature six years ago, I was the only active farmer in the state legislature. That was a huge surprise to me. We've come a long way. Agriculture being the number two industry in this state, it's really huge in the state and kind of become the go-to guy as chair of the House Ag Committee. Um, and so for that reason, I would like to continue that work and, and uh, hope that uh, you would consider me come on. Hi folks, my name is Gary Glenn and I am running for the State House of Representatives to go to Lansing. But because I am so concerned about what I see happening to my country and to our constitutional form of government, James Madison wrote over 200 years ago that it is the duty of the state legislature to interpose itself between the people of its state and the federal government when the federal government exceeds its constitutional authority. And clearly with Obamacare and a host of other examples, they have done so. So I'm going to be looking for an opportunity not only to address the issues that we have to face here as a state, but for the opportunity to be a leader in protecting the people of this state from a federal government that has exceeded its bounds. My father was a World War II Marine, survived the attack on Pearl Harbor, was willing to die if he had to, to leave me a free country. And I grew up believing it was just a, a birthright, we're Americans, and that my children and grandchildren would be left a free country. But I think we'd all agree that if we don't stand up and fight to make sure that's the case, that that is now an issue, it's being debated. And I'm not comfortable just standing on the sidelines watching that type of thing happen. I've been in leadership positions on a lot of different issues we talk about as Republicans. Labor law, education, health care reform, values. I'm the only veteran running for this position. And you folks know me. I was a speaker at the first Tea Party rally we had in April of 2009. You know what I stand for, the values I will defend as your next state representative. Thank you for your consideration. 
Thank you, candidates. Um, I, I would like to give them a round of applause now and thank them for their service. <laughs> sacrifices you have to make. So so thank you, thank you, gentlemen, for doing that before we get into the questions. Um, first question, and we're just going to continue the series here. So Carl, you will start with the, with the next one, is uh, what is your position on Common Core education standards? Okay, thank you uh, for that question. Uh, education, yeah, that's not. education is very important to me. I already pointed out my two daughters, and my third one's at camp. Uh, within a year, they'll all be in the public schools. And they're making sure they're prepared for the jobs of tomorrow is my number one priority with education. And whether they call it Common Core today or something else tomorrow, as your state representative, the only or the most important thing I'm going to be concerned with is local control. Local control to our school boards have a say on how they teach our kids and our teachers. So I do not want bureaucrats in Lansing, and heaven forbid, in Washington, D.C., telling us how we teach our kids. So as your state representative, I'm going to continue, no matter what it's called, making sure our teachers and administrators have local control. Thank you. The, uh, I, actually, I serve on the Education Committee. I'm married to a school teacher. Pierce, so Common Core has been very important to me. She comes home and shakes her head, we don't need this stuff. We did stop in the House of Representatives, we held it up uh, with, the, with the budgets when it came through, and then we did the vote on the Education Committee. I voted against it both times. Uh, I, I am urging you folks, and people in my district as well, down in Lapeer County, to get involved with your local school boards, because this is really an issue of local control. And if our local school boards are doing their job, Common Core is just a standard, it isn't a curriculum. Our local school boards need to be involved. We need people like you to get involved in our local school boards, to get out there, to make those decisions for the locals, not let the state or federal government make those decisions. I'm gonna answer this question very specifically and I hope you will detect a pattern throughout the rest of this forum tonight. I was asked a question, what is my position on Common Core? I am against Common Core. Clear? Is that clear? Yeah. I'm against it. I will not only oppose it, but I will be a leader in opposing it. Any attempt by the federal government with the enticement of our tax dollars funneled through Washington and given back to us with blackmail attached to it to dictate to us at the local level how and when and where we'll educate our children. I'm opposed to any program through which the federal government is doing data mining. I'm opposed to a program that's controlled by a private corporation and if Michigan signs on to it, doesn't have the prerogative to change any of the standards. None of us are against standards, but they ought to be determined by our local school boards and at best by policymakers in the state capital in Lansing. So I'm going to clearly and definitively answer the question. I am opposed to Common Core. Thank you. I seem to be the old guy up here. Do I have to stand up every time? Would you mind if I just sit <laughs> I'm opposed to Common Core. Next question. What is your plan to fund fixing roads and bridges? Well, we did a plan in the House of Representatives. I was involved. I also serve on the Transportation Committee. I think we put a very good plan together to not raise gas taxes. Uh, there was a small increase in diesel fuel tax to bring it up parity to gasoline. Uh, we did roll it into a, what we proposed was a roll into a wholesale tax. Part of the problem we've got with road funding today is since 1994, we have not had an increase at all in road funding. And obviously we're using less gas, so there's less revenue coming in. I believe we've got enough revenue of the state. Uh, you know, we've got budgets being passed that are increased across the board uh, for a lot of the departments. The funding is there. But the, the legislation that we passed over at the Senate was then uh, in the Senate committee was 
bogged down and a huge increase was added to it. Uh, fortunately, the Senate did not pass that, bill, so basically nothing happened. So, thank you. Mike, I'm just all jittery and nervous over here. That's <laughs> I get, 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 get a little older, you won't get so yeah. <laughs> Uh, this is an opportunity for make you to make another definitive statement and promise to you as taxpayers. As your next state representative, I will not vote to increase any tax, including the gas tax. Now, I think there is a disconnect between the people of Michigan and policymakers in that we pay the sixth highest gas tax in the nation and have some of the worst roads. Because how many of you think a whole big portion of the taxes collected on gas goes to roads. As I knock on doors, I run into people who think all of the gas tax, all the taxes collected on gases go to roads. And instead, it's a minority of the money that's collected on, on the tax and gas that goes to roads. So I think the solution is to have the gas tax be a user fee as intended and a much larger portion and maybe even 100% of the gas tax revenues go to fix our roads and bridges. Amen. Thank you. Well, I was in the battle in the Senate to fight off what uh, some of our leadership wanted to do to raise our gas taxes. And, and frankly, some of the discussions that was talked about was a lot of money. Now, what would you think in three years if you had another 40 cents on top of four? What's going on in, in Saudi Arabia, what's going on up the Far East now, we may be paying, they said on the TV this morning, five or six dollars a gallon. Now, if we had a Dutch put a little, little increase, but put it uh, as a percentage on the wholesale price, now we're charging a wholesale price that goes up every year without even voting on it. And that's what would happen. So four, five, six dollars worth of gas, another seven percent would go on that. So we fought it off, and we just, I couldn't vote to add another tax. Is there money there? I believe there's money there. First thing the state wants to do, just like the feds, is if there's a problem, let's just throw a bunch of money in it, that'll fix it. And I believe we ought to take a minute, step back, and see what we can do to make our roads better without throwing a whole lot more money. And there is ways. Thank you. Uh, fixing roads and our bridges needs to be a top priority of the state legislator. There's not a township meeting or when I'm knocking on doors where, they, where people like you don't bring up, hey, our roads are falling apart, we need to fix it. But to fix it, I think we need to look at, to seek efficiencies within our state budget. We have a 52, $53 billion budget. We need to make sure that money's going to roads, so roads um, are, last longer. The other, um, and Because if we don't have good roads, we're not gonna be able to attract businesses to this state, and the businesses that are in the state are gonna leave. So as your state representative, roads and bridges will be one of my top priorities. Thanks. Next, <clears throat> next question. What is the state's role, and I assume that means either legislative or executive branch, um, in decisions on how private landowners can use their property? Well, the, uh, the legitimate function of government is to protect our inherent, God-given, God-endowed private property rights, life and liberty, and the right to pursue happiness as guaranteed by the Constitution. That's the purpose of the government, to protect those rights. It is not the government's authority to hand us rights. The government's not the source of our rights. And its only legitimate purpose is supposed to be to protect those rights. And one thing I think we need to do is restore the legislature's oversight authority over rules and regs promulgated by state agencies. The legislature used to have a 14-day period after which any time the DNR or DEQ or any other regulatory agency, uh, the, uh, the roundabout people, used to have 14 days during which they could veto that and it was taken away by a state Supreme Court decision. So I would support a state constitutional amendment to restore the legislature's oversight over all rules and regs so that when they do something you don't like, you have a legislator who is accountable to you that you can get your hands on. Stand up on that one. <laughs> I, I agree with what he said. There's a whole lot in that issue that I've only got a minute to talk about, so I'm not going to get real deep in it. But it is one of the biggest things that we as Americans have lost to our state and lost to our country. 
is our right to be able to own our own property and do with it as we want. Sure, we have to have zoning laws. Sure, we don't want our neighbors uh, growing cattle on the fence line in our backyard. Uh, and surely we want to be able to use our property the way we intend to use it. Uh, but some of the things that the state government does, um, I'm not going to say it's because of them wanting to do it or they're out there trying to get us. But some of the things, I'm not sure that the federal government don't. Um, give me a little, give me another second, right? Because uh, I can't finish this off in two seconds. But I guess the way I'll finish it off is um, we got to stand up to the folks that are passing the laws. Why? And them. And the governor has to hold them to the, their ability to take our rights away from us. Uh, and all of us that have been there before can tell you it's not easy. Sometimes it happens with a Supreme Court case. I'm sorry. <laughs> The key word of the question is private. Private land is private, so I, the government needs to keep their hands off our private land. Unless you're doing something that's going to hurt society, I think the government needs to stay out of your business. Yes, standing up is a way to do it tonight. Um, <laughs> absolutely, I can give you an example of a private, we're all going to agree on this, no doubt, private property rights are private property rights. I'm a landowner at home where I farm for a living. And uh, I can give you a perfect example of what involved, and I know it's important to the Tea Party, and that was the pig issue, for those of you that follow the pig issue. We had the, uh, and, and then to explain this in a, in a minute, it's not going to happen either, but uh, we stood up for that, I stood up for that in the House, we worked hard, I went up against big agriculture on that issue. And uh, we had an order put in place by the government that was started under Granholm, and a Republican government, we thought we could stop that, but it continued on under the Republican governor, the, uh, the Department of Natural Resources and the Department of uh, DEQ involved uh, in telling guys what kind of pigs they can grow, what kind of pigs they can't grow. And uh, that's just wrong, and uh, I stood up for it, and we're still watching how that comes out in the, in the courts. Thank you. I'm going to sit down. <laughs> uh, we obviously have uh, candidates tonight uh, who are uh, running in uh, two separate districts, I believe, one for Senate, one for House. So this question uh, applies a little more specifically. What do you feel is the biggest challenge facing your district? I believe, I believe there's not any different challenge in any district in the state other than our economy and jobs. And I ran on that four years ago. And trust me, we have worked diligently to do that. I think the, the administration we have now has kept that in focus and used that to do some things that uh, I believe was to bring more jobs here. Some of us agree with it, some of us don't agree with it. But I really believe that's probably one of the biggest things that we still need to continue focusing on. Can government make it happen? No. No, government can't make it happen. But we can lay some groundwork to what makes it a whole lot easier for more jobs to come in. Thank you. The biggest challenge facing our region, the 98th district, is jobs, what I'll call, and many people call the brain drain. We're educating our children, and they're having to leave to find good jobs. As I look out in the audience today, I don't see many of my high school friends, because most of them have left to find good jobs. And the ones that I know that want to come back are not able to. So as your state representative, I want to do everything possible to make sure that we have good paying jobs so my daughters, your kids, your grandkids, your spouses can stay in this area if they want to, or if they want to come back, come back. But we need to make, have good paying jobs. Thank you. Again, it's going to be the same thing. You know, jobs is number one. I don't think there's any doubt about it. People need work. Uh, in order to, to pay taxes and to make the state run better, we need jobs. That's in my district. That covers the new district that I'm working at, uh, representing, and Tuscola and Bay Counties as well. Pierre County still has some of the worst unemployment because of our tie to the automobile industry. So we've got to get jobs back here, and the way we do that is we get rid of restrictions. We don't create jobs on a government basis. We allow private industry by getting the heck out of the road. Uh, same answer. The need for good-paying jobs is the most critical issue facing Bay and Midland counties. 
I was a leader in 2011 as a founding board member of the Michigan Freedom to Work Coalition, which launched the effort to pressure the legislature to accomplish the miracle of making Michigan America's 24th right to work state, which I think is the biggest economic development tool that we have enacted in the last several decades because it's such a major factor in where plants decide to locate and bring their jobs. You also, I hope, will vote yes on the August ballot on the personal property tax repeal as applied to businesses because not many states do that. And that's also an impediment to jobs locating in Michigan. We're the only state in the nation that's lost population since the turn of the century. We had the worst job loss in America. My oldest son took my first two granddaughters and moved to West Virginia. My second son moved to California to find work about a month ago. It's personal. My highest priority is going to be to do everything I can to make Michigan more competitive and more attractive to new and higher paying jobs. So the counter to that is what is the best asset of your district that needs to be promoted? There's quite a few assets in this area. Um, it's hard almost to pick one. But we live in a beautiful region. Uh, over and overall, the, um, this area gets voted as one of the best places to raise your family year after year. As your state representative, I'm going to make sure we continue to keep that as, a, as this a wonderful area. There, we have good job opportunities. We need better, but we have good job opportunities. We have wonderful community organizations. We've got sports. We have great schools. We have good, good um, um, arts. I, people from not around this area don't realize how beautiful and how great our assets are within this. So we need to promote, man, that's a quick 60 seconds, <laughs> this region. Because we have a wonderful region. I love living here, and I'm proud of it. Thank you. 90 seconds is really quick up here. but. Uh, Obviously, uh, my background, agriculture is the number one thing that I would like to promote the district. I think that's very important up here in Tuscola and Bay Counties. We've got a lot that we can do with agriculture. I've worked heavy, heavy in agriculture and promoting that for the last six years, and I would like to continue that. We've got processing possibilities in this state that are good-paying jobs. Believe it or not, there's only one soybean processing facility in the state, and that's in Zeeland, Michigan. Otherwise, our, our uh, soybeans are shipped out of this state. We should be processing this stuff here coming up with a product, a finished product can go out so we can create those good jobs in agriculture right here in our own backyard. You know, once we remove the impediments to new jobs coming to Michigan, and then we get to the point of competing and hoping that our fair share of them comes to Bay and Midland counties. The thing that, well, you know, you kind of have mixed feelings. Do we really want to tell the whole world how great it is here? Uh, but our quality of life, we live in this little oasis a small community that because of some major employers and benefactors and philanthropists has things that much larger cities don't have. Yes, we've got an economic climate that has been in a downturn over the last five years, but not as bad as a lot of communities in Michigan. We've got a housing market that, yeah, it's not as good as it was five years ago, but it's a lot better than a lot of other communities in Michigan. We've got quality schools. Can we do better? Of course. But our schools are a lot better than some schools in other parts of Michigan. We live in this oasis, and it will be the duty of a state representative representing Bay and Midland counties to protect that special quality of life that we and our families enjoy here in Midland and Bay counties. Thank you. Totally, agriculture dominates my district, which is all of the farm, and which is Bay County, Aranac County, and uh, we. I call everywhere I go. I call my district the breadbasket of the state. We produce more agricultural commodities than any other area in the state of Michigan. But not only are we great in agriculture, you know what? I've grown to love Bay City. I, I don't care what you say. I'm a rural guy, but the more time I spend in Bay City, the more I really believe that I can almost live there. <laughs> I told my wife that the other day, and she said, we ain't moving anywhere. But if I had to, I, I could live in Bay City. It's a great city, and you know what? Now we got Dal Corning, so Midland ain't so great after all.
I think the reason the 90 seconds is fast because it's actually 60. <laughs> but, but this is a real test for politicians to see how succinct you can really be. Next question. Uh, do you feel movie product production tax credits and similar tax credits are a sound fiscal policy for Michigan state government? Absolutely not. Our tax credits, and we have worked hard in the House to stop every year we send the budget back to the Senate, and it gets put back in because of, uh, unfortunately, the leadership in the Senate, the guy named Randy Richard, Bill, that's his little pet project. Uh, to get that in there, and it gets done, it gets put back, and it gets sent back to us. Unfortunately, we have the omnibus, omnibus budgets, which I don't really agree with, we've had for the last few years since Governor Snyder came in, so we really don't have that ability to pull those out and put them in. I have voted consistently against special interest. I don't believe in giving tax credits to special interest groups. Uh, you know, why should the guy across the road that's putting up a new facility get a tax credit and the guy that's been there believing in Michigan for the last 30 years doesn't get it? That's not fair. So I am certainly against the tax credits uh, that are involved with the movie productions. Well, I don't think our tax dollars ought to be used by government in the movie industry or any other industry to play favorites, to pick winners and losers, to require existing Michigan businesses to have to compete with new competitors who are being subsidized with their tax dollars. That's just inherently unfair. Uh, now, if you want to know something that really will have a significant effect in attracting new movie production to Michigan, we've just done it in the last couple of years. I worked closely with Charlton Heston, former president of the National Rifle Association, on the right to work issue. Having a right to work law is a major determinant in where Hollywood decides to pick its sets. You read the industry news, I remember Clint Eastwood had a news conference once in which he indicated a lot of movie production was going to right to work states. Uh, I knew some other actors in that industry who were opening production companies in right to work states because they wanted the flexibility of having a workforce that was free to join a union if they choose but was not compelled to do so. Uh, so, whether it be movies or any other type of industry, we ought to be able to fairly compete, not have one subsidized with tax dollars against the other. I've been against that from the beginning. In fact, on the original vote that allowed them to start with, I voted against it. There are some people that, in the House that did vote for it, but I mean, the first original vote to allow them, I voted against them. I voted against them in committee many times. In fact, in the Appropriations Committee, They've had to fight and twist arms to get us to include it in one of the bills. So I'm against it, I voted against it, and I'll continue to vote against it. Even our Senate uh, fiscal agency has said, zero jobs. It's added nothing to our economy, but yet they keep leadership, keeps plowing it down our throats year after year after year. I think this is the last year. New leader. Thanks. I don't think the government should be in the business of picking winners and losers. It's not government's job. Government needs to make taxes and regulatory minimum for all businesses to make our state competitive. So we shouldn't just be giving special favors to one group over another. We need to have a good competitive tax environment and a good competitive regulatory environment for all businesses. What are the merits you use to evaluate legislation to determine if you can support it? Well, uh, there's going to be three that are right up at the top. Number one, is it constitutional? I'm just sharing my heart with you, so I might as well tell you the truth. Is the way that I vote more or less likely to lead to me someday hearing the words, good, well done, good and faithful servant? Is the way that I vote going to make my wife and children proud or embarrassed to be seen with? And is it or is it not constitutional? And if it's not constitutional, then I shouldn't be voting for it, no matter what arguments are crafted in favor of it. I think in simple terms, what I would try to do best, as uh, Abraham Lincoln said, to do the right as God gives us to see the right, is to do the right thing. And not to care what the newspapers say, no, no offense, John, not to care what the newspaper editorialists say, not to care what other politicians may say, not to care what's in the letters to the editor, but to do the right thing as best as my conscience can determine and my commitment to constitutional principles. I think that ought to be the standard. 
I think Gary didn't hit the nail on the head. Um, in 98% of those, 98, I'm guessing, 98, I'll say it, 98% of those votes he's talking about, they're easy, piece of cake. Everybody agrees. Uh, the pump funds are the, those last two percenters. Number one, you're not sure how your district votes. I want you to vote. That is key. Whether or not your district is in favor of it, I think we are a representative government and we should represent our district every time. Mm, I don't poll every time I have a tough vote. Some others poll and say it's okay, but I don't poll. So how do I make my decision? I think I have to make up my own mind as what I think is right or wrong. And I campaign to you on my beliefs and what I put my faith and trust in will help me find the right answer. Is it always right? Maybe not. And then you've got to remember, we can't all please 100% of the people every time we make a vote. But this last term has been the toughest for me than my first six years in the House. But there was some stuff that really, really, really I had to pour over and come up with the right answer. And you can only vote two ways. You can't vote maybe, and you can't don't have a third choice. So it's been tough for me to do the right thing and understand that I have people looking at me over my shoulder every day and trying to represent my district, trying to do what's right in the same way, and then coming up with the right answer. Like I said in the opening, as your state representative, I'm going to ask myself three questions. Is it good for jobs? Is it good for families? Is it good for the community? Hopefully you've heard that before. And if it is, I will support it. So those are my three things. Is it good for jobs, good for families, and good for communities? I'll ask myself before I vote on any piece of legislation. Obviously, as a constitutional, the number one thing in my mind, I think that has to be over top of everything. We have a constitution that was put together by our forefathers for a reason, and that is that we should follow that constitution. Um, obviously, we have to listen to our constituents as well. One thing you'll find about, for most of you in here don't know me, um, you will find that I'm a person that uh, studies the issues, makes a decision, and I wouldn't tell you an answer to a question here any different than I would sitting in front of the MEA. I go to the MEA meetings, I go to the other meetings, I go to the union meetings, but I tell them the same reasons, the same stories, the same thing that I tell you this group here. So I think it's really important that we look at the honesty and the integrity of the position, that we take uh, all the, the constituents that we have in our district into consideration as well, of course family, all that plays in as well. What is your position regarding the use of state tax revenue to bail out cities that have been forced to file bankruptcy? I'm not sure Detroit was forced, but that's another debate. I'm absolutely against it. I don't think our money should have went down there. Detroit never put a nickel in that. Some of the retirees has put something in, but they had assets that they never touched. I'm absolutely against any money that went to Detroit. I too would be against using any of our tax revenue to bail out a city. Just because the city was fiscally irresponsible, if we bail them out without fixing the problem, what, are we, what message are we sending? To the government that you can just keep spending and spending? No, that's, that's the wrong answer. We need to not bail them out, but help them fix their problem. So I would be absolutely be against bailing them out. Thank you. So here comes the first question, because I did vote for the legislation. I don't consider it a bailout. I consider saving the taxpayers and you problems in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, our own Attorney General, Rick, uh, Bill Schutte, has made a statement that he thinks that our Constitution makes us responsible for public pensions. That could put us close to $3 billion of responsibility. If Detroit is allowed, those pensions are allowed to go, that goes to court, and we could be responsible for that because you don't think that every other city and every other school district is watching to see what happens in Detroit? $194 million was very cheap for us to get off to fix this problem. We now have an oversight, we will have an oversight if it gets done, over that city for possibly the next 30 years, minimum of 10 years. So there's a lot of good things in that legislation. I'd be glad to explain it to you when you get finished. 
I do not believe that the taxpayers of Bay and Midland County have a responsibility to bail out irresponsible government of any city, Detroit included. I believe I read that if they just sold one painting for the Detroit Institute of Arts, they would cover a substantial portion of the debt that they're facing. And I don't think you ought to have to take more money out of your grocery budget so that the city of Detroit doesn't have to make those kind of painful decisions commensurate with their irresponsibility. So, no, I would not support using the tax dollars to come up the hardworking people of our two counties in the 98th district to bail out Detroit or any other city. I guess that's about as plain as I can put it. Thank you. Next question. Instead of Michigan adding more state police, would you support the state covering patrol expenses for the county sheriffs and leave local policing to them? Anytime we can do, I'd be open to looking at any plan. Anytime we can have local control, I'm for it. So what I would do, I would sit down with our sheriff, who I know very well who's out here in the audience today, as well as the state police, and see if there's a way, because my priorities are going to be to make sure our citizens are safe and we're spending our taxpayer dollars in a fiscal, responsible way. So I'm not opposed to sitting down and looking at a plan that will put more police locally under the sheriff's department versus the state police. But again, I'd have to see the plan and work with both the state police and the sheriff to make sure it makes fiscal sense and protects our citizens. I'm a firm believer in local control, and, and I'd like to see more money going. It's a shame that our county sheriff's department uh, learned a short time ago are some of the most underpaid people in the in the state. Uh, uh, state police posts. I, I, I do believe our state police is important. I do support the idea of putting more money towards local control. Uh, stop growing state police. I, I won't even bother to stand up for this one. I think Carl gave, gave a great answer, and I 100% agree. I've always been a local support guy, and I still am. But we've got some problems in our cities that the local police are not fixing. And that's some of the greatest crime this country has ever seen inside our cities. Saginaw, Flint, Detroit, Pontiac, and there's corruption there like you can't believe. I don't believe. I want my tax dollars going there to support local police that are going to blow the money and spend that on stuff that they don't need to be spent on. But do I support the state police? There's a role for the state police. Do I support them inside our cities where we're running rampant with crime? Yeah, I do. Do you support fracking and other methods of domestic energy production? And do you feel this is an issue that should be left to the states to decide for themselves? I'll answer that backwards. I've been, absolutely, I think the state should make that decision. We've had this has a very been been a very large issue in Lapeer County just recently. Uh, they have been coming in and leasing land. I have I 240 acre tract. They haven't come to me myself yet. Um, I a lot of folks apparently un, unfortunately the Sierra Club has been very active in Lapeer County in trying to stop this. I believe that we need to find every way we can to get gases out of our soils. Michigan has some of the strictest regulations on fracking. I haven't had the chance yet, but I intend to visit. There's three facilities uh, I found out in St. Lac County. I'm going to go and visit some of those facilities because uh, talking to some of the folks in St. Lac County, they've had no issues up there at all. So I believe we need to get off the dole of the foreign government uh, oil companies, and we need to get down to uh, producing our own product here in this country. I do support fracking. I do believe it ought to be left up to the states, and we'd like to sing that God bless America. And he has beyond our ability to measure. There is one oil field out under Colorado that has three trillion barrels of oil. When the oil companies take it out from under federal land, they got to pay the federal government 12% royalties on the price of a barrel of oil. And if we harvested all three trillion of those barrels, folks, that would pay off the national debt. Assuming, of course, Congress could be trusted not to spend this additional hundred trillion in debt using the revenue. We've got an estimated $8 billion in oil under the Great Lakes. The Canadians have 2,000 wells taking oil out from under the Great Lakes, not with wells in the water, but a mile away from the water using 
the modern directional drilling technology, you go down a mile, go over a mile, they'll never come anywhere close to the, the water. And the Michigan Environmental Science Board says there would be no threat whatsoever to the environment. So that'd be another way that Michigan could be self-sufficient. We need to encourage a refinery to come to Michigan too, so we don't have to continue to pay the higher gas prices from shipping it from Houston. My answer is yes, yes, yes. I think that's four, right? Yes. <laughs> Yes, I support fracking in Michigan. In fact, we've been doing it for a very long time. We need safe and reliable energy in this state. Because if we don't have good, reliable, inexpensive energy in our state, we're going to lose our manufacturers who are already here. We're not going to attract any new manufacturing to the state. Michigan needs to stay competitive, so we need a good energy policy. So fracking is just one of the ways we need to do to produce more energy for our state. Should any public land in Michigan be controlled by the federal government, or, if it were possible, should control of all currently federal owned land be turned over to the state? There's a simple principle here, it's local control, and I think uh, the Midland School Board making decisions about education in Midland is better than the state doing it, the state doing it is better than the federal government doing it, and the same thing applies to our public lands, except for military bases. There might be some circumstances in which those ought to re be a return to state control, but except in military bases, uh, I think all public land in the state of Michigan could be managed just as efficiently, just as responsibly from an environmental standpoint, and I think better from a use standpoint by local governments, county commissioners, and by the state legislature than it can be by votes that are subject to congressmen from Florida and California and Texas who've never set foot in Michigan. So I think we need to protect our public lands for multiple use, hunting, recreation, skiing, snowmobiling, and I think, don't you think we're just as capable of making those kind of responsible decisions as Michiganders, as leaving it to be made by people who've never set foot in our state? That was a great answer, and I'll elaborate on it just a little bit. You know, the federal government has taken over everything we've got now. Now they want to take over all the waters of the United States under the Clean Water Act. And if we don't get to work and testify to the EPA, tell them why they shouldn't take it, they're going to own all of our ditches, our uh, water runways, our tiling, everything. Well, the federal government is on a, and I don't know that it was just Obama, because I believe Bush was heading in that direction too. But for some reason, the federal government wants to take over our whole country in every aspect. Can we fight it? Yeah, there's ways we can fight it, and we're working on some of those ways. But it's a constant barrage of fight, 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 and it's never going to let up. Um, I don't know what's going to let up. I don't see it in either party. In Washington. When I think of public land, I think of Iowa Royal National Park, where I've been camping with my kids, or Sleeping Bear Dunes, where my kids have run in the sand or outside of Michigan, the Grand Canyon, Yosemite. So there is, a, in my opinion, a need for the federal government to own some federal land, because I don't want people in Arizona saying, my kids can't go see the Grand Canyon. But should the federal government take over more land? Absolutely not. It's a state and local control issue. And uh, I guess I kind of agree with Carl that I think there are some national parks that probably should be national parks. Uh, state parks should be state parks, and we should have control of the majority of them. I don't think there's a continuation. We have a real problem even in this state with, with the state of Michigan wanting to buy more and more land, continue to buy more and more land. Let's, if that, as soon as they buy that land that comes off the, off the market, they pay a, a, a payment in lieu of taxes. Instead of paying the same amount of taxes, the state of Michigan decides what they're going to pay in taxes, which isn't a good situation. I was a township treasurer for many years, and we fought that over and over again, township treasurer and supervisor that they pay the taxes that they feel is right, not, not for the assessors and local people. So I do think uh, local control is the best place to go. Uh, federal and state people should not own a lot, any additional land, I should say. All right, that's the end of my list. Did you get a couple others uh, from the audience, or we run out of time? I don't know what your schedule is. We have some questions back here that uh, stand just one group. Bring me a couple. And 
will hope I can win. Let's try this one. This is uh, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, who's next before I hit? You look at it. Okay, okay. Yeah, well, Mike, Mike. You, you may want to sit down for this one. I'm not sure. <laughs> this is a, an important issue. Power. Where do you stand on the encroachment of Islamic factions in this state? And will you pass ALAC, which is the American Laws for American Courts? I'm not familiar with that, but I'm absolutely against share of all coming into our courts. And I think, is that what we're talking about here? I'm absolutely against that. I don't even think they should have a separate court in Dearborn that would support anything like that. This is America. How on earth can they come over here and trounce on our Constitution and say it's all because of their religious belief? I'm a Christian. Nobody gives me any better standing anywhere else because I'm a Christian, especially in court. <laughs> they would be after me in court. But I, I am absolutely totally against that. Well, I hate to do this, but Mike, you said it pretty good. I mean, there's no reason to really expand on Mike's answer. I would pretty much 100% support what he said. If any one of us stands up and says anything different, I think you guys would probably shoot us. But <laughs> and that would be good because you're absolutely right. It just it just irritates. Uh, I'm sure it irritates us all to no degree of what's going on when it comes to uh, Sharia law. And I'm not familiar with what the uh, EC is either, but absolutely, uh, I would fight against this. The uh, American Law for American Courts legislation is legislation that says that no judge in the state of Michigan can cite as precedent or as the basis for any ruling anything other than the United States and the state of Michigan's Constitution. They cannot refer to Sharia law, for example, in Dearborn or anywhere else. And I certainly would support that. It'll, it'll require, well, there's some difference of opinion as to whether or not you could do it statutorily, which of course we know how close judges pay attention to statutes. They think they're all-powerful can rewrite them. So it might take a state constitutional amendment, which state judges would have to at least pretend to abide by, and I would support putting on our state ballot a constitutional amendment. The people of Oklahoma did that, and it passed with like 70% of the vote. I also believe that judges who swear an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States or the state of Michigan, if they instead cite foreign law as the basis for their decisions, because they have violated that oath, should be impeached. Yeah. As many of us know that uh, either got kids in college or are saving for kids in college, uh, tuition increases and the total cost of college has gone up at uh, roughly two times the rate of uh, the general cost of living index and even faster than medical care costs. So what would you do? to uh, uh, retard, reduce, or stop tuition hikes. Carl. A very uh, important question, especially with uh, three kids under 10. Um, right now, trying to save for college, not knowing how much it's gonna cost my kids to attend school. It's scary for a lot of us out there, is how can we afford college? Um, it's not, a lot of easy answers, but what we need to do is um, we need to put more cost controls into the college like we've done um, in the public schools. I still think colleges can do more cost-cutting measures, seek more effic efficiencies, do more online, um, have high school students um, take some college courses while they're still in high school to make it more affordable. But at the rate that college is going right now, the kids are not going to be able to afford college in the future. And that scares me as your state representative. It's going now, I don't think they can afford it already. Uh, colleges have gotten out of control. I was fortunate enough, my kids have all uh, 
been through college, and we were fortunate to get them out of college without a huge debt. Uh, we've got a serious problem at the federal level with what they're doing with, loan, with loans and uh, starting to the idea that Obama's got to forgive these loans or not necessarily forgive them, but decide whether you have the ability to pay them back or not. We've got a lot of huge problems. I wish I knew the answer. I wish I knew the answer to how we keep that cost down. I am unfortunately have said for a long time, in my mind, colleges are a racket. Uh, you know, you drive by a college facility, my gosh, they are, uh, the buildings and the, and the things that go on there are, are out of control of cost. They should be able to keep their costs down, but yet we keep pumping more money into them and their costs keep increasing. I'm not a real good uh, uh, an advocate for controls, but in this case, I think if they're going to get state money, then there should be some more controls put up. I think Representative Daly hit on a key uh, combination of ele elements. We keep giving them more money, and the prices keep going up. The only thing that grows faster than college tuition is the cost of health care. Two things in our society, which the providers of which know that if they raise the price, the government's just going to write more checks. So it's a basic law of economics. If you know that you're going to constantly get a supply of money that will meet your raised price, there's no incentive to keep prices down. They will continue to raise them. And so I, I think, you know, we do have affordable options in the state of Michigan. All of my kids have gone to college, to classes at Delta. One of my kids got an associate degree there. That's pretty affordable. Uh, University of Michigan was beyond our reach, but we do have some affordable options. And I know this is kind of a tangential uh, comment on that, but I don't think a citizen of Michigan, a student in Michigan, uh, should find themselves paying less to go to college in any college in our state than somebody who's not even a legal resident of the United States of America. Uh, behind the Appropriations Committee, we have tried to put controls on the appropriations that we give. There's a little thing in our Constitution that says if they have an elected board by the people, we can't control the money that we give them. That's kind of weird, isn't it? We can't do one thing to tell them what to do with the money that we give them. Now, we seem to keep putting more money in, but we cut back for two or three years. You know what happened when we cut back on state dollars going there? They jacked the tuition up. Did that stop any more people from going? No, they just kept going and kept going. So we've tried to put controls. We can't control. I think what, what's going to happen is eventually uh, we're going to have to start building more community colleges. And that's where we're going to have to raise our kids, in, in local colleges, local universities. Uh, U of M and Michigan State, uh, two of the biggest ones in our state, and I'm not downgrading them at all. They're good universities, but I don't know how anybody can afford to send their kids there. They do. For some reason, they keep sending, and they keep growing, even with the high cost of tuition today. So uh, I'm almost to the point where I'm not sure what the answer is, and I think the uh, playing field will level uh, on its own without government probably trying to get too deep. Try this for the last question. If elected, or in a couple of cases, re-elected, what would be the first bill that you would propose? Boy, you hate, hate to be the first person to go on this one. <laughs> <laughs> somebody has to be. Yeah, somebody had to be first, is right. Um, I'm just trying to think of, uh, of what, and it's not going to come right off the top of my head probably right now. I've been working on a lot of legislation in the different areas. Of most, most of the time it's revolving, revolving around agriculture. Um, I'm just trying to think of what would I reintroduce that I'm not going to be able to get done this time around. And uh, I'll tell you, it's, uh, I, uh, I'm going to tell you what my first piece of legislation was when I came in the office. And that was for me, Michigan Agriculture Environmental Assurance Program, which is a program that, a uh, voluntary program that farmers do to become environmentally sound stewards of the land. So I introduced that bill when I first come in. Actually, that was my first piece of legislation passed into law, and it was uh, Governor Snyder's first as well. So I was pretty proud of that piece of legislation, but it was not a mandate to farmers. It's a voluntary program. It's been a really good program to show the people of Michigan is an environmentally sound state. A lot of different issues, obviously, any of us could pick, but uh, picking one that is a priority, we've got to make sure that every child has the access to the best and safest schools, and I think that that ought to be a decision that's determined by parents. 
of all incomes. So I would introduce a constitutional amendment that would implement the Mackinac Center for Public Policy's universal tuition tax credit that would allow any individual, parent, or company to pay the tuition for any child to any public or non-public school in the state of Michigan, capped at about one-third to a half of what the state spends per pupil for every child in the public system. So that when that scholarship is used, it actually leaves more money per pupil for the children who remain in the public school system. So it's a win-win-win. But it would empower low-income parents to have the same freedom of choice as better-off parents. And only, I believe, in a com competition and choice environment do we get the best product at the best price. And it ought to be available for every child in Michigan, not just those who can afford it. Well, as Kevin said, it's difficult to pick one particular bill. Plus, if you've been there for four years, I have a number of bills in the hopper right now, but I think probably most of you know that I'm kind of a strong supporter of the Second Amendment. And I have a number of bills there on that issue that I don't think is going to get done. I have a couple of them that I think the governor's going to sign. But probably uh, the first one I introduce, mm, I'm going on a limb too, but it's going to be something related to that. The first bill I would, uh, uh, as, a, your, as your state representative, the first bill I would put up would be jobs related. Michigan needs good paying jobs, so it would be job related because we need, we need to keep our kids, our family members in this area. So whether it's less regulation, lower taxes, it will be job related because we need to work on jobs which will help our family, which will help our community. Thank you. Big thank you to these folks. It's not easy to sit up here and be grilled and have everybody looking at your every move and your every twitch and so on and so forth, but we really appreciate being able to see you face to face in this kind of environment and answering the broad questions that, uh, that we were able to ask tonight. And a big thank you to Brian and Stan and whoever else was involved in organizing this. This takes a lot of work and uh, uh, they do it on their own time. And I'm most appreciative for what they do, so give my hand. Thank you, Jim, for doing a great job as a moderator tonight and appreciate the chance to come up tonight. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you got to know me, you know that I'm a straight, honest, forward person. Unfortunately, a lot of people that get into the state legislature or into politics in any way get a bad rap because of a few bad people. I stood up for what I thought was right. Uh, as I mentioned before, I listen to both sides of an issue. Uh, uh, I call people back. I respond to them when they have questions. Uh, I'm a really easy to access person that's in the state legislature. I think when you run for office, for public office, that you should be available. You should be available, unfortunately, at the grocery store, at Home Depot, or wherever you go, and you are. So, I stood up for right to work. Uh, you know, I was one of the few legislators that had a town hall meeting in my district. In fact, Gary was at that town hall meeting. He came a little rambunctious there, but uh, we had that town hall meeting, and we listened to both sides. I didn't come back and I didn't bend, because unfortunately that town hall meeting was uh, taken over by a group of uh, union radicals, and all union people aren't radicals in any sort. My wife's a union member, by golly, and uh, her and I get along most of the time. Uh, anybody that's been married for 36 years understands that one. I stood up against Obamacare. I think the exchanges is one thing that, uh, you know, we did stop in the state legislature, thanks to the House of Representatives. We did stop the exchanges from happening in our state, and that gives us the ability, I think, going to quarter of a later date to help stop that program. Um, Another thing you'll, you'll learn about me if you, you look at my literature and see, I have a perfect voting record. I have been in the state legislature for five and a half years, never missed a day in office, a day at the Lansing Capitol, never missed a vote. I think that's really important. Unfortunately, uh, you know, fortunately, I guess I should say, Michigan Votes started keeping track of that uh, only about, uh, I think it was 10 years ago, 
so that uh, because that caused people to start being good voting records from there on. But I really appreciate the chance to be here tonight. I would really appreciate your vote on August 5th, and all you have to remember is vote once and vote daily. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate this opportunity, folks. Uh, those of you who are with the Tea Party, we've been together now for five years since that first day out at the Midland County Courthouse Steps. As I said earlier, I'm running for office to go to the State House in Lansing, but largely because I care about what's happening to my country, and I believe I've got a set of skills and experiences on a wide array of issues that would enable me to do a good, effective job of protecting the quality of life in Bay and Midland Counties from the first day. First step, I think those of you who know me know the values that I stand for and I will continue to advocate for those values if I have a title in front of my name. I think our country's freedom and our free enterprise economy are at the precipice. I would do everything I could as a member of the state legislature with a title in front of my name and an office to stand up to the federal government and to fight to restore our health care freedom to protect our economic freedom and to protect our religious freedom, all of which I think are under attack by the forces in our culture today. I have experience on and have been in leadership positions on labor law reform, education reform, health care reform, authored the first medical savings account, health, health care plan for any county in America 20 years ago when I was a county commissioner, values types issues. I'm the only veteran running for this position. We've seen how that's been an issue recently. If, if we needed something to scare us away from a federal government-run health care program for the rest of us, it ought to be what we've seen happening to our veterans. I believe in telling you the truth about where I stand. Ask me a question about an issue you asked if we stood on Common Core. I'm the only candidate in this, in this race who told you definitively I'm against Common Core. You ask me where I stand on other issues, I'm going to tell you the truth because I think as a matter of integrity, you have the right to know up front. I don't want you to be surprised and vote for me and then say later you didn't know what you were getting. I care about our country, I care about my children, I want them to have the same free country I inherited from my parents and those who came before them. And I will abide by and fight to restore constitutional principle to our state and federal government the best I can from the State House of Representatives in Lansing. Thank you very much. Stand up for this one. I'm getting old for week, but I'll stand up. Three things about my green that I want to leave with you. Number one is my faith. I've been a devout Christian, I'm a Baptist, so I may not fit with everybody here. All my life I was born and raised a Baptist. Now well, that's not necessarily true, but that's my faith. I've been active in my church for years and years. I've been a deacon, I've been a Sunday school teacher. We have a bus ministry, I was a bus captain, my wife was a bus leader. We've done everything in our church. We've raised our kids in our church. Uh, I believe in the values that God has given us, and I adhere to them. I don't care if you did get a letter in the mail that said I drank wine and, and um, had caviar. That's absolutely not true. I won't get into that one. But my faith, my family. I have five kids. I have 20 grandkids. They're the most important part of my life. Absolutely the most important part. My wife and I bought a farm. We had to buy ours. Uh, and it was tough, but we bought a farm because we wanted to raise our kids on a farm so we could teach them how to work. And you know what? They know how to work now. I don't want to have to feed them after they got out of school. We put them all through college in a private college. They helped. We helped. That's the American way, isn't it? Do we have to give our kids everything? No. We need to help them give them a lift up. And it's hard work, too. You know, I worked for General Motors for 30 years, retired. And while I was working for General Motors, I was also farming on the side. I was also, at the end, ran for county commissioner. And it was hard work. It was hard work raising five kids. Tell me anybody here that says it ain't hard work. And you know what? Being a legislator is hard work, too. Nobody told me that all I had to do was go down there and push buttons. Because there's more to being a legislator than just push, pushing buttons. There's work to be done. There's bills to be introduced. And I've done my share of I've stood up for Michigan to the federal government through the balanced budget amendment. I've stood up to our governor and the Obama administration on our gun laws, and I'll stand up to anybody else who takes our freedom away, and I have a record to prove it. Thank you. I guess I'm 
I'll move out to the side. Again, I want to thank the We the People for putting on tonight's forum. And also, I want to thank my wife, Julie, who's here with us tonight. She's my biggest supporter, not only on the campaign, but also in my life. Um, you said there's a clear difference between me and my opponent. Only one candidate is running to represent all the people in this district, and that is me. I am running to represent the common person. I am also running to represent our children's future. Because I'm concerned that career politicians are putting their votes ahead of our children's future. I also am the only businessman running in this race who has proven he can add jobs to the economy. I understand balancing budgets, making payroll, and I believe Lansing needs someone with some business experience because some of the laws they pass just baffle me. And as your state representative, like I said before, my values are jobs, family, community. Three things I'm going to ask myself before I vote every time. Is it good for jobs? Is it good for families? Is it good for community? I hope I earned your vote tonight. And again, and you'll vote for me in August and again in November. And we, I will be your friend in the State House. And we can build a better and brighter Michigan together. Thank you.